Okay, good morning, lovers of the word. This is Dr. Tom. I want to thank you for joining me. Um, we're going to take a small break just today from uh, the book of John. We're left off in chapter 16, but we're going to we're going to discuss the refiner's fire because we're in the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit in John 16, and I think it would be aloof not to touch upon what the refiner's fire is and what the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit are in the life of the believer. So, Father, bless this reading of your word. In Christ Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. And, of course, Malachi 3 takes place during the days of Christ. So if you got your Bibles, turn over to Malachi, the third chapter, and we will begin our reading at verse 1. He says, Behold, stand in awe. Whenever you hear the word behold, it means to stop and take note of. Now, behold, I will send is the same singular word, shalak. And basically what it means is God is going to send an individual. It means it's from the hand of God. So he says, Behold, I will send my messenger, who? John the Baptist. He shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So here we have the announcement first about the herald, um, which is John the Baptist. <clears throat> John the Baptist was going to be the one God would send to prepare the way for him to come in. Why? Do you understand Malachi is the last book of the, the Old Testament? But between Malachi and Matthew is 400 years. 400 years where no prophet has spoken. We're not talking about a decade or two decades. We're talking about four hundred years okay they were only in Egypt 270 years 400 years friends that's that is like six generations there's a lot can happen in 400 years we have in the history of of the world entire empires that have risen and fallen in less than 400 years so in 400 years time and you understand when Malachi's ending he's not telling them that they're doing good they have the temple's been rebuilt it's been restored but what is it they're no longer worshiping the God of the scriptures and Malachi is giving them shall we say not only a warning but a call to repentance. So at the time that the herald comes out, they haven't heard any solid preaching or teaching in quite some time. Most of these people had probably never heard it their entire lives. Their parents had never heard it. Their grandparents had never heard it in their entire lives. Okay? So today, we look at it as six complete generations because, you know, six times eight is 48. And they overlap, and you know, three score and ten. Seventy years is the length of a man. So here we have at least six complete generations, six groups of people that have completely lived their lives. But literally, ten generations is how you would equate it at forty years per man. Because they usually had their children, and their children were grown and getting and having their own children at forty years of age, their grandchildren. So 10 is the number that deals with tribulation, okay? We're looking at 400 years. And then John the Baptist comes on the scene. He comes on, not dressed like a, a televangelist, not dressed like a, a Pharisee or a Sadducee wearing brand new clothing and braided hair and, and a phylactery around the top of it with a high rise. It wasn't the Pope that invented the high rise. That actually is the way it's described for the priestly garb of the Levite. So, he didn't come out dressed like somebody from the Roman Empire. Actually, he came out dressed like a madman, a crazy man. His hair was not cut. It was all the way down his back. 
He looked like a wild man. He would be hard from being out in the sun all day. He didn't sit in a chair or in a house. He was out gathering locusts or grasshoppers and eating wild honey and drinking water right from the stream. He didn't go and buy processed food or cook bread. This was a man who simply lived and ate as he went. He was a true child of God. John the Baptist had the Holy Spirit in him from conception. How do we know this? He's in the womb of Elizabeth. He's six months old, and when Jesus walked into the room, the babe leapt with joy. Why? Because it knew its Savior. The Holy Spirit in him spoke to him, and he knew that Jesus Christ, his Messiah, was in the room. And he was excited. Friends, John the Baptist was unlike any other man that had lived before or since that time period. And he's going to turn the hearts. He's going to prepare people to seek the Lord. And then they, the Bible tells us, verse 1, The Lord whom you seek, the one you are seeking. You see, friends, people are seeking God continuously. But many times they are, most of the time, they're seeking the wrong God. All roads do not lead to heaven. You can't be in Islam. You can't be a Muslim and expect to go to heaven. You will be cast into hell with Allah and all of his followers. Muhammad has been burning in hell since the 6th century AD. You can't be into witchcraft. You can't be into hoodoo, voodoo. Friends, you can put a name on it. Hinduism, Shintoism, Buddhism. Any name you put on them, if it ain't the name of Jesus Christ, you are going to hell. There is only one Savior. There is only one God. There is only one name given amongst men whereby you may be saved, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. So the true God whom you seek he shall come suddenly to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. This means the one who is bringing you the covenant, the one that God sent to you to fulfill the covenant. What is the covenant? This is my blood. Take ye, drink of it. This is my flesh. Take you and eat of it. He says, this is my blood of the New Testament, the new covenant. You see, in the blood of bulls and goats, God was not satisfied. We read that in Hebrews chapter 10. Lo, I go to a body that my father has prepared for me. For in the offering the blood of bulls and goats, he has not been satisfied. So lo, I go to do thy will, O God. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. Jesus on his way to earth to go into Mary and become the Christ child. Flesh will wrap around that spirit of God and become a living child. He was the covenant. He was the one that all those prophecies spoke about. When you would slay the lamb and put the blood over the doorposts and then cook that lamb and everybody would eat of it and leave nothing till the morning, he was the lamb. His blood is over the door of your heart. Jesus must be the meat, the bread, the wine, that which brings joy to your heart and strength to your heart. Jesus is the one. He's going to come suddenly to his temple. And he did. He walked in. They weren't expecting him. But yet he took his rightful place. And look what happens. He will be the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. You're glad your sins can be forgiven and that God will wash you. But behold, he says this again. He shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Stop and take note. He will come. But look at verse 2. Who may abide the day of his coming? <laughs> Who shall stand when he appeareth? He is like refiner's fire and fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering 
in righteousness. Friend, this is an incredible statement. First, the word Levi means joined to. He is going to take those who are joined to him as his servants. It doesn't just mean joined to. It means joined to him as his servants, his ministers, his priests. Now, people think that the tribe of Levi were a bunch of milk toast love huggers. Um, I mean, these false revivals going on around the country are, are just love-ins. And they're not true because they're not based on the word of God. There's no repentance. When Moses came down off the mountain, all of Israel, except him and Joshua, were gathered around a bull, dancing, stripping, doing all kinds of lascivious and evil acts of worship. Why? Because they thought the bull represented the true Lord God. They didn't realize it was a created thing that represented Satan. Okay? So they were dancing and doing false worship. When Moses went to come down off the mountain, he already knew. Joshua said, there's war in the camp. Do you hear that? Moses says, it's not the sound of war you hear, Joshua. It's the sound of idolatry. So what happened? When he got down there, he said, who is on the Lord's side? And see, this is what set the tribe of Levi apart as his priests for all time and eternity. The tribe of Levi stepped up and he says, put your swords on and slay them from one end until the other. Friends, they went through and everybody that was involved in this orgy worship of this false god, they killed them. They didn't beat them. They didn't warn them. They slaughtered them. Then they took the bull and broke it into pieces. Smashed it into the water with the straw and the fire. And the ones that lived... He made them drink it. You know, I bet you that made them pretty sick. But that's the way it is. False worship will cause you to be sick and will cause you to die and go to a devil's hell. They weren't able to take it. But the Levites who slew over 20,000 people, I mean, that's, that's a big slaughter. They became the servants of the Lord forever because they stood there. So the Levites are warring priests servants of god aren't milk toasts they're people that know the truth and they stand for the truth and that's how you contend for the faith you're kind you're loving but you tell the truth and you stand your ground i love my wife she's so cute she really is but she's like a little chihuahua she will stand her ground if she's right and i feel like a big bear that always has to back her up and step in front of her if the time gets hard but she's perfect. She's, she really is. God has given me the perfect wife. I'm so thankful. Friend, as a man or a woman of God, you need to choose your side now and you need to let it stand. You don't let people ridicule the word of God. You want true revival to happen? Guess what? It'll happen when you see people turning away from sin and turning to the living God. Because that's what he's talking about. The one that they thought they loved and adored is coming up. And those who are joined to him, the Levites, he will purge them as gold and silver. Why? That they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Okay? So what is it? This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It is called the Refiner's Fire. One of my favorite songs um, was written by Steve Green, and it's on the album called The Mission. And I never forget, I, I heard him, now this, friends, this is going back over 30 years, when I was a young Christian, and I used to turn my Moody Bible radio on every time I'd go to work. I was in construction, but I was also a child of God. So when I went to the construction sites, I'd set my radio up, listen to sermons and Christian music all day. And I remember hearing on a job site once, Steve Green talk about how he wrote that song. And when he wrote it, he showed it to his father. His father said, are you sure you want to sing that? He says, why? He says, because God will not hold you guiltless. But when you sing this, God will hear you. 
And the, the words were, burn in me, purify, let the Lord be glorified. It is consuming my soul, cleansing me, making me whole. No matter what I should lose, I choose the refiner's fire. Now, friends, this is what the refiner's fire will do. The refiner's fire will do like in the case of Jacob. He wrestled with the Lord all night. He wanted Christianity his own way, right? Jacob was no slouch. A shepherd was a mighty man because you had to fight off marauders. You had to fight off bears. You had to fight off mountain lions. Real lions. You had to protect those sheep. You had to protect those goats and the livestock. Shepherds were mighty warring men of God. And the Levites were the same. And those who are joined to Jesus Christ are Levites. You are warring priests, ambassadors. You defend that which your country stands for. He is going to be like a refiner's fire. What does that mean? He is going to burn away everything in your life that you don't need. Well, why did you use the example of Jacob? Because you know what? Jacob wanted to know the name of God. And so God touched his hamstring and shrank it, shrank the sinew or the tendon and the ligaments so that his leg pulled up. It, it withered. He had to use a cane crutch to walk the rest of his life he was never able to run again one foot being you know this much shorter than the other one and it and it would have been like this because the hamstring would have pulled up and made the most people don't realize he, he was crippled for the rest of his life this was a man that knew how to run how to fight how to jump but god took his health and made it so that he was dependent upon him God did the same thing to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, prior to the road to Emmaus, was basically a greatly feared man. He would take soldiers. He may have been short, but he was very stern. But after the road where he saw the Lord, he says, Saul, why do you kick against the pricks? God blinded him. He literally gave him such an infection in his eyes that Paul was very blind. He could see almost nothing. Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And he says, I knew a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. You see, Paul was stoned to death. And he says, I don't know if I was in my body. Only God knows. He says, but he was caught up into paradise and he heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. What? God had made it so that he was dependent upon him. Physically, he was no longer a strong man. He had actually been stoned to death and died and was caught up to heaven. But God sent him back because it wasn't his time. He says in verse 6, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think above me that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. At least I should be exalted above measure. The abundance through the abundance of the revelations given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ rest on me. Therefore I take pleasure in necessities, in reproaches, in infirmities, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. I am become a fool in glory, and you have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, and for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. What's he saying? Everybody saw Paul's infirmities. He walked hunched over. He was only like five foot two. He had a voice that was like chalkboard getting nails on it. 
he had an infection. They he smelled. The the infection coming out of his eyes, the smell of his body with his disease. Friends, his body became his enemy. But you know what? He said that he was enduring infirmities, persecutions, tribulations for the glory of God. But why would it glorify God? He said because he gave him a lot of knowledge. And as a result, he also gave him infirmities. So he would not get puffed up. Proud. Friends, pride is an abomination to God. We have nothing that God has not given us. So the Apostle Paul is talking about the refiner's fire and how the closer he got to God, the weaker his body got and the sicker his body got. But God was stronger in him. And that's the thing. God will burn out of you the things that may stand in the way. I know in my life I used to pride myself on being able to outwork any four or five man crew. And I did. It was just the way it was. I had done martial arts my whole life, worked hard my whole life, and it was a proud point in my life where I could get out and just outwork anybody and do things in a day that would take some men three or four days. You know, it's just the way it is. But now, with my heart, I almost pass out just when I bend over. I can do things, but after an hour and a half, I'm shot for the rest of the day and I'm trying to sit up and breathe at night. And you know what? I'd love to be healthy. But you know what? I prefer having knowledge from God. I prefer knowing the Lord. I prefer growing in grace. I would rather have my infirmities in the Lord Jesus than anything of this world and what it has to offer. And that's what the Apostle Paul was saying. That he'll glory in nothing except Jesus Christ and the work that he's done. Paul was in the refiner's fire. He was having the dross. Those things you want burned away out of your life you don't want to buy a gold ring that has chunks of lead in it or other things you want that gold to be purified to to shine and god is removing out of you those things but he's not just a refining fire part of it is the fuller's soap and you say okay fuller's soap what's the difference fuller's soap was it had a lie base if you've ever worked with Red Devil Lye, and I have, because when we'd butcher hogs, we would scald them in hot water with Red Devil Lye, and the hair would fall off like, just like water hose, would just fall right off. Why? Because the lye would actually eat the root out. It ate everything out. That pig skin would be as clean as the day is long. And then you'd have to wash the crap out of it to get the lye out of it. Fuller soap will burn out of you those things that are sticking to you. It'll clean your pores like nothing else. <coughs> Sorry about that, folks. That's another thing. A heart condition will always make it seem like you have the flu, but it's just because it can't get the fluids out of your body. So God will use the fuller soap and fuller soap stings. It's painful. Um, if you've ever been washed in or worked with lye or fuller soap, it'll take the skin right off you. It'll take all your calluses off. It'll make you baby smooth. It'll make you whiter than white. And you see, that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. And it, it trains us and we grow through that. God is working in you to make you more like Jesus Christ. Look what he says, verse 4 of Malachi 3, Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old. And I will be near to you in judgment. I'll be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, false swearers. You see, this is the, the, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. He, he will speak to you when you're around somebody that's a sorcerer or an adulterer or a false swearer. In other words, somebody that says they're going to do something they know against those that oppress the hireling and his wages. In other words, try to cheat people out of their work and get more out of them or not pay them. The widow, the fatherless, those that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. 
He says in verse 7, turn back unto me. Friends, and you know, we can read in Romans chapter 7, talking about the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. Uh, that's in Romans 8, verse 18. Um, there's at least 95 verses that in the Bible that talk about suffering. One is the ministry of suffering. Like Timothy had it. Paul had it. Paul didn't cure himself. He could have healed through the power of God. If it was God's will, he could have healed himself. He could have healed, healed Timothy. What did he do? He said, Timothy, drink wine to kill the pain in your stomach. He had trigonosis. He had worms eating through his guts. Everybody has parasites. That's why in, in pretty much every country, except the United States, they give parasite cleanses. Before a kid can go to school, he has to take a parasite cleanse. And it's to kill everything inside of them. Friends, the Lord God gives to his children the ministry of suffering. Those that seek to live righteously shall suffer persecution. So let me ask you this. Are you persecuted? Do you feel like the world is against you? Do you feel like Christianity costs you? Do you feel like people try to compel you to compromise? You see, if you do, then that tells me you've got the Holy Spirit in you. Because all who seek to live righteously in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. The world is going to be against them. People will turn against you and try to get you to compromise your faith. Why? Because they're being controlled by unholy spirits of this world. But here's the thing, my friend. If you have given your life to Jesus Christ, you will suffer. The more knowledge he gives you, the more you will suffer. The ministry of suffering is given to those that God uses closest in his work. The refiner's fire is for everyone. Rather than fight the flame, because you can put metal into flame and it'll fight it many times. I, I've seen that happening where it doesn't want to break down, it doesn't want to give it. But the problem is, is the hotter the metal gets and the longer it's in the fire, it will break down. God will continue the work in you until the day of Jesus Christ. He that has begun a good work in you will be continuing it until the day you see Jesus Christ. My friend, if you're truly born again, you are in the refiner's fire. So what's the deal? The deal is, is you surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. You accept your place. I had somebody uh, tell me yesterday, you know, your messages used to be really good. I found a cassette tape of yours from uh, 2009 when you were preaching in Whitehall. And, and they said it was when, it's the best sermon I've heard in years. And um, you used to be a really good preacher, and I felt convicted. I thought, wow, I used to put a lot more effort into it. Nowadays, because of my blood flow and my, my brain, I'm constantly having to write things down. I just don't have the memory capacity I used to. So I'm going to put more effort into studying the scriptures and making them applicable. Friends, this is Dr. Tom. Don't resist the hand of God. Don't fight against it. Surrender to it. How do you surrender? When you simply accept the Lord's teaching. If you can't quit a sin, say, Lord, you know what? I'm stuck on this. I keep giving myself over to this and I'm sorry. Would you please forgive me and cleanse me? The healing power of God is what you need in your life. And he will give it to you. Don't fight the refiner. Don't fight the fuller soap. But rather seek it. The more you seek Jesus, the more you will have him. He's there with you. All right, this is Dr. Tom. I pray this message blesses you and that you are being thoroughly refined and cleansed. In Jesus' name, amen.